we're going to try and move on to a, a sort of more general discussion. And I, you know, forgive us, but that discussion is really uh, focused on what the Road Safety Trust uh, can do and should do to move things forward. Because obviously there's a lot of uh, bilateral discussions, the uh, European standards area is uh, moving on, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm just going to try and share my screen very quickly uh, and show uh, the discussion points that we have identified. That doesn't work. Okay. Okay, you should be able to see the screen now. Um, let me just make sure I can see you. All of you, okay. Um, at least some of you. Uh, you may need to shout at once, it's hard to share it. But we've, we've I sort of identified two areas. Um, one is uh, really concerned with uh, what Peter was talking about, which is the what needs to be done to improve minimum standards for helmets. Uh, and that's really important because I guess minimum standards means that everybody is guaranteed a decent rate of protection. Uh, and this is really, uh, this is the same as for vehicle safety. Uh, we have the general safety regulation guaranteeing the minimum standards. And then we have uh, Euro NCAP providing uh, consumer ratings and, and driving the standards up all the time. And Euro NCAP is always in advance of the, um, the minimum standards, not very surprisingly. Um, so I guess, particularly directed at you, Peter. You said there's various things taking place. There's the new head form. Uh, you mentioned also that uh, currently there's not actually a cycle helmet subgroup, if I understood it correctly. So it seems that the cycle helmet, even the, if the minimum standards are moved up and do take into account uh, rotational forces, uh, better methods, the 45 degree angle test and so on, um, how can we make sure that uh, the cycle helmet community is at the table? Yeah, I mean, we, we to say the, the ball, is, ball, ball is rolling. Um, uh, as you say, the standard should be minimum uh, safety requirement, and that is important. So uh, a new bicycle helmet standard as a new uh, motorcycle helmet test standard will probably, um, I mean, most helmets will pass, uh, but the test method anyway will uh, force the helmet manufacturers to think on uh, not only the linear impact, but also oblique impact. So definitely, I think there will be a lot of <coughs> improvements in helmet uh, design. I mean, the, there are a couple of systems on the market as we know of. Um, uh, it's not only MIPS, there is uh, 60, we have wave cell, there is um, a number of them on, on the market and there will come definitely more. Uh, so <clears throat> if uh, we can put this into a new standard, I think that definitely will create safer helmets, even if that will be uh, as you said, a minimum uh, requirement. And therefore, I think also the rating methods are important uh, where we can separate um, helmets that are good, but also helmets that are better. Okay. And can we have a date on that? And is there anything that we can do to push things fast, make things faster, complain, you know, I mean, who when you come up with that new standard, does it have to be legislated then? It does presumably or not. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we all have an uh, important role here of uh, educating. Um, also for, uh, I mean, there are standardization groups uh, in Europe, um, national standardization committees where they don't really have the biomechanical knowledge or understanding. Mm. So I think we need to educate everyone on the need for uh, 
safer head protection and why we need it. So I think it's very important with everything we can do just to inform about um, that uh, we actually can make helmets uh, safer and better and take <coughs> um, the most common impact situation that is an oblique impact into account when uh, we uh, certify helmets. Okay, so sorry, forgive me for hogging the discussion, but I do have a couple more questions on that, I guess. So first of all, when it's passed in SEN, does it, is it automatically adopted or does it have to be then go through some uh, European Parliament or whatever um, approval beyond that? Okay, now I understand. No, I mean, <clears throat> um, uh, there is a group that will come with a proposal of uh, a revision of the standard, and then they will send it out to uh, the different national standardization committees for voting. Okay. And the voting system is that uh, countries like Germany, France have uh, a larger impact of their vote. So it's a weighted vote depending on the number of citizens in that country. So a vote from Sweden is less uh, powerful than a vote from Germany. Uh, but when that is voted and uh, gone through, it's a, of course a bi bi biocratic system, uh, as also in the US with the ASTM and everything, that it takes time um, to, to work with standardization. And this uh, date 20, uh, in uh, 2024 is if everything goes smoothly and okay. All can, uh, we have a majority from the voting, but then there is a decision and uh, it should, should uh, be inequality so it can be harmonized. Okay, and is retention, for example, retention is already in there. Um, one of the things I noticed when I wear a bicycle helmet, it's not just retention, uh, for a sudden impact, but the fact that actually while I'm wearing it, it's continually loosening up. Uh, the straps don't stay in 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 place. Um, yeah. My wife complains about exactly the same thing with a completely different helmet model. Uh, and yeah. I guess if it's not strapped on well, it won't perform very well. There are two tests on the retention system that should test both strength and also um, uh, Kind of the durability, but uh, problem that could need uh, need improvements as well. Okay, Sally, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, it's a quick question. I was really hoping not to mention Brexit today, but I'm going to have to <laughs> uh, because the in terms of how the RST can help, um, is there any point us putting pressure on? Um, the BSI who I know are still aligned with the N1078 or not when it comes to this voting uh, is the UK now completely out of the voting that you talked about um, with regards to an improved standard? Oh sorry was that a question to me? Yeah, I think it yes, it was. was. Sorry, Peter. It was about whether the UK is still involved and has a vote. Um, yes, in... uh, yes, and no. Uh, actually, uh, to be honest, I'm I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> okay, I guess that's a question we can ask BSI, the British Standards Institute. So, yeah. Okay, uh, there's several other hands up. Remy? Uh, as long as standards are concerned, I would like to, yes, to mention that Working Group 11, uh, in, in Working Group 11, we are addressing uh, the oblique impact and I'm happy to do so, but I'm afraid there is nobody looking at the linear impact and the linear impact needs also improvement as it has been shown also this afternoon by Peter, it is uh, that the linear impact is not a linear impact because it in induces a lot of rotation. So I will not open the whole discussion now, but 
either we block this rotation or we regard it and then we also express the risk which is uh, uh, due to this rotation. Uh, but anyway, I can just, uh, I would like just to focus on the fact that there are a number of issues related with the linear impact, also in terms of threshold of 250 G, etc., in terms of advanced criteria. And in my knowledge, nobody is looking at that. Okay, Peter, do you have a comment on that? No, I mean, we, we um, me, I think both, we agree on that, me and uh, Remy. So we'll uh, work uh, definitely uh, to add the <clears throat> measurement of the rotational kinematics also in the linear impacts in future standards. Okay, so I think what you're saying is that's not on the agenda for the immediate change, but would be on the agenda for Maybe a, well, a we, no, I, I, I think, I mean, as long as we do get this new head form in, head fo form in place, um, uh, it, every, it, it is all about time, time. So I think if we have time, if we can, definitely we will add in the six degrees of freedom measurement into the current okay. shock absorption okay. test as well. Uh, but it, we, we do have a very, very, um, uh, what do you say, <laughs> tight uh, agenda to get um, uh, the oblique impact into the test standard. So uh, hopefully we can get both. But uh, you are correct, Remy, that we have discussed to, to get it uh, as, uh, uh, in, into the standard later but I will do my best to, to get it in as early as possible and, and hopefully 2024. Okay. Um, we're gonna to have to move on because we still have a bit more to discuss. Uh, so, but Heather, you have a comment or question. Yes, thank you. Um, within the, um, the equestrian um, fraternity, we um, have our helmets properly fitted by somebody who is trained. I have not had a helmet for a bicycle fitted by anybody, let alone somebody who is tra uh, trained. And the equestrian community in Britain um, is uh, led by BETA, the British Equestrian Trade Association. And I was just wondering um, what people's views were because the best helmet is not going to perform as well as it should if it's not properly fitted and it's not properly fastened and Oliver did um, obliquely uh, comment on the fastening um, aspect of it and I was just wondering whether there is um, any um, any parallel um, with the this um, equestrian trade association elsewhere in Europe or whether it's something that um, would um, would help in the um, would help consumers purchase a helmet that fits properly because head shapes are different and I know that I can go to a, a, helm, a riding helmet manufacturer and I can go through their range and maybe only one in their range fits my head even with some adjustments and some manufacturers ranges do not fit me at all so um, I was just wondering um, what, uh, what the views were on um, fitting of cycle helmets to improve their um, um, uh, ability to protect um, from head injury. I'm not sure there's any comment. Um, but I guess they are available in different sizes. And certainly when I bought my helmet, I did go to the bicycle shop and check out various uh, different helmets. And I made sure that I had one that was comfortable, that fitted, didn't slide around on my head, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I mean, they often come with pads so that you can adjust the fit. They come with bands. So you can adjust the fit. So you're not just stuck with a single helmet size like you are, for example, with motorcycle helmets. It's a very different kind of uh, situation. Helmets are constructed with a shell and then usually uh, some kind of uh, variable uh, structure inside that will fit to the individual head. 
But is there, um, um, is this something that the trust could um, start to look forward okay. to? to um, um, you know, because we were asking these questions, what can the trust do to improve? Yeah. Maybe and this we, could maybe be one we can. of the things that yeah. could improve cycle, um, uh, pe people's um, understanding of the importance of wearing a cycle helmet and the importance of wearing one that fits properly and is fastened properly. Yeah, yeah, you do see one people riding along with helmets that are at totally ridiculous angles and so on. So I'm sure that's something we could publicise. Louise, you had a question. Yes, yeah, so a question. It's it's probably for Peter again, and it's about the um, cycle helmet working group that's currently not active. And I wondered quite what that meant, and if if that was something that the participants here today could influence, given the level of interest. Uh, we we uh, we know that there are interests from uh, two countries in Europe to take. Uh, the lead on that, so we will um, handle that, uh, I, I hope. So um, that, that is for the National Standardization Committees to, uh, to judge and, and if they uh, want to take that responsibility. And now I th uh, we do have uh, two countries that are interested. So I think it will be solved in a couple of months. Okay. Because that, that's a step we'd need to take things, well, for this work to progress at all, I guess. Thank you. It is. Okay. So I think, you know, looking at the clock, we're going to move on to the other question, which is the potential for a harmonised safety rating in the EU, UK, and maybe even uh, uh, worldwide, which was an issue that was... Uh, uh, raised particularly um, in the uh, presentation from from Steve uh, at the at the beginning. So, do is it desirable? Um, is it do we you know are we content with having multiple schemes? Does that cause consumer confusion? Can we move to a harmonised rating scheme? Um, I mean, I think if we look at what Euro NCAP has achieved versus what maybe multiple safety ratings would have achieved, um, you know, the, the impact, forgive the word of that, uh, is tremendous. It's really driven up standards. Uh, manufacturers don't want to uh, make uh, vehicles that only get uh, three or four stars. Uh, they come back and if they do get awarded four stars, they come back and uh, improve the design. And that was mentioned as well um, in at least uh, one presentation. Um, so uh, how can we or should we move towards a harmonized scheme? And if so, uh, how do we achieve that? Remy. Yeah, as I said it for to to Ho to Hofson uh, Stephen, uh, I think and that uh, harmonization is essential for the public. Uh, so that said, um, what is the strongness of that? Uh, there should be only one, but there must be a board, so that it's not one who is the strongest who wins, who will manage everything. So there must be a, a board, a little bit like in your Cup, uh, yeah. a board of decision, yeah? And, and, and if we manage a board and, and a unique uh, test method, I'm convinced that uh, that is the future for, for consumer, finally. And what I tried to say earlier to also was, I was not so clear, but the idea was to say, that we are all doing chooses, yeah, or choices or hypotheses, yeah. Uh, I, I, you can see the temperature. We do not take into account temperature, uh, different speeds, yeah, and then FA models, FA models for the oblique impact, but not for the linear. These are all acceptable hypotheses. But if we are all together stronger, we will maybe able to reduce the number of hypotheses and do something very strong, that, that's it. Uh, and today I'm quite 
uh, optimistic because uh, Phil may remember uh, in 2015, I think there was a harmonization uh, workshop in Davis. Yeah. Yep. And um, in between, when I look properly on it, we have a lot of improvement. We have all the oblique impact. We have all the 45 degree angle. We have all the free the free hair dropping. This is a huge discussion. It is evident today, but it was not at that time. And it's the same in the motorcycle world. Yeah. Uh, and if I, I summarize, I say the heart is free. Uh, the, the oblique is the oblique and it is not 30. It's not 60. No, it's 45 everywhere. Wonderful. And what else? Maybe it was not so clear uh, about the, the oblique tests, the angles from uh, Steve, but I think today is not enough. It was a nice discussion, but we need to sit together on a table looking on each impact and trying a synthesis. Yeah, so I thank you for your initiative, but uh, it's not negative when I say it's not enough, but we need more <laughs> technical discussions. Yeah. Okay, um, I guess that that's something that the Road Safety Trust could definitely take away and even think about how to um, maybe give some impetus to, I might even mention the word funding to, I mean it's not impossible that we would actually uh, be prepared to take that on board as a task. Um, I'm not speaking officially for the Road Safety Trust here because we would have to go back, obviously uh, we have to go back to the trustees and say something about that. But clearly, you know, we're interested in this initiative. Uh, we want to take it forward. If there is the potential for harmonization, that would be absolutely terrific. And if we were an agent to help that, that would also be terrific. Um, but I'll let some other people speak, not on behalf of the trust, but some other people here in the uh, participant group. So Jeffrey, you had a comment to make. Yes, thank you, Oliver. And thank you, Remy. I, I fully agree with Remy, and I'm really in favor of having a harmonized uh, scheme as well. I think with all the different ratings uh, in the world right now, it, it's going to be very confusing for the uh, for the consumer. With all the respect, of course, for the work that, that you've done uh, in, in all of the different countries. Um, but I think there are several reasons that... that uh, the, uh, uh, yeah in favor of having a harmonized uh, rating. I mean, looking at the uh, at the ad form right now and being used in different rating schemes, uh, I think it's well known that the hybrid tree ad form is not made for this kind of test. And so this can be, of course, be improved and it's being done in uh, WG11. Um, but I think uh, being a kind of um, board and having uh, a rating scheme like your rank app uh, ahead of all the legislation and standards uh, that we have right now uh, could definitely um, improve the, the, the safety of helmets uh, uh, in the world right now. Um, so yeah, I would be really in favor of, of uh, taking this on board and, and let's say uh, work together with all of you and uh, see if we can come to, to an harmonized standard. Okay. I guess as soon as you have a board, then you need a decision-making process, which is That's not very so easy. true. That's really not easy, but I would also just, um, if we look at your rank up, and we have quite some uh, experience with your rank up uh, testing on the automotive, um, it's not like you have to take all the steps at the same time. I mean, right. you, can, you can definitely over a year improve and add uh, additional uh, tests or uh, higher limits uh, or whatever you want to uh, improve on safety, uh, helmet safety uh, over here. I mean, that, that's the same as your rank up is doing. It's not all like just like in one year of testing and it's done. You can keep on improving this. Well, I, I guess that's the other thing. I mean, it was interesting hearing from Helena about how, you know, their philosophy of scoring is basic almost to score tougher each year because the standards go up. And I think that's very much been the Euro NCAP approach as well. That, you know, the standards that you had in 2010 are not the standards you apply in 2021 and so on. Uh, Phil. Yeah. Thanks, Oliver. Yeah, and great um, the, you know, points made about the sort of technical 
um, program board. Um, one thing that I'd add to that, though, is actually combined with this sort of technical agreement, I think that there is certainly need for a campaign of some sort to go alongside this. Uh, two points to that. One is a, a, a communication campaign, essentially, and one is an education campaign. Yep. Um, and that's something that RST hopefully would be in a position to We'd to love also, to do that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the key. Um, obviously, there's technical um, elements for this to iron out, but ultimately it's about consumer buy-in at the end of the day. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, I've got one or two ideas. I won't dive into them too much depth in, in this call. Um, but I think that's the secret to this being a success is, is, uh, is to is to have a, a strong campaign, you know, lobbying, you know, campaign and uh, educational campaign, um, speaking to consumer, you know, through consumers, um, consumer bodies as well, cycling bodies and and um, and and media that they um, access, that cyclists access. Um, yep. So, I mean, yeah, and I think that might be the secret to to making this a success as well. And speaking to the retailers because the retailers are absolutely key at the point of sale and the information that they have to guide people to buy a better helmet, labeling of helmets, etc., is important. I mean, obviously, you know, it'd be really nice if you had something like the, uh, you know, the uh, energy efficiency label on the helmet when you, when you buy it, uh, you know, validated by an external body so that there was a label there that said this is a five-star helmet. Yeah. That's incredibly powerful. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm absolutely behind having a a technical, essentially a technical steering board um, for this. But I think that that to to do that on its own won't have the same power as having uh, a, a plan for for uh, f to to go with that for 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 uh, a campaign to go with it. Well, yeah, more than a campaign. I mean, I yeah. tried to buy a. Um, when my son was in Beijing, another personal story, I tried to buy him a five-star motorcycle helmet because he was by, by, uh, riding around on an electric uh, bike, bike uh, electric motorcycle. And it was incredibly hard to find a shop that even knew what I was talking about <laughs> in the UK. But yeah, okay, Helena. Hey, but I think, yeah. Um... One of the steps that we did uh, last year, working together with you, um, that's uh, one way of trying to spread uh, the information regarding uh, the safe helmet uh, from outside, from uh, Sweden, and also trying to have um, have it in in the whole Europe. I think that would be very good. Uh, of course, it, it would be um, because I know that uh, the stores really like because we are when we are releasing our mm. test result, we got a like a kit for um, for the stores or the manufacturers that they can actually add uh, a tag on uh, on the helmet. Um, I think the stores want to have that sort of things because they can talk to the customers that this is actually a better helmet than the other and so on. Okay. I'm um, more than happy to collaborate with others. Yeah, and hearing, hearing from you about how you publicize it in Sweden, I think would be really useful for us in the UK as well, because obviously we did get some traction out of the, the last set of tests. I think we hope that there'll be, uh, you know, more uh, publicity even about the next set of tests, but uh, you know, uh, we're, we're pushing back against the current situation in which nobody's heard of these kinds of tests at all. So uh, anything that you can guide us on would be much appreciated. 